Okay, let's start with a uh, review of dynamic optimization. Uh, so far the uh, we reviewed in the previous class, we reviewed static optimization and we realized that most of the optimization algorithms are, uh, are geared towards finding uh, a point that satisfies first order necessary condition for optimality. Now, if you remember, the diagram was, this is the entire space X and this is your let's say first order necessary condition, then you have second order necessary condition, then you have optimal point, and then you have the point that satisfies sufficient conditions, right? So that's a strict inclusion throughout the process. And all we are finding is points in the outermost layer, okay? That's, that, that, those are the points that satisfy first order necessary conditions for optimality. Right? And if you want to prove that they are optimal, you have to either come up with a sufficient condition or prove that it is globally optimal in some sense. And that's really the key drawback that I can mention of all the gradient related method is, but that's the best method we have. Okay, So instead of trying to uh, use any arbitrary point in the space X or come up with some heuristic uh, in order to optimize your objective function, at least gradient descent gives you a good way to <coughs> prune the solution space and find approximately optimal solution that at least satisfy first order necessary conditions for optimality. Now, the same story is true even for dynamic decision problems, but of course in some cases you can get provably optimal solutions, so let's see um, how do we do that, okay? You know, it's kind of unfortunate that I caught cold in the last day of the class. Well, it's kind of good and bad in both sense. Uh, I don't have to miss classes now. Okay, what's the setting? The setting is xt plus 1 equals ft xt t goes from 0 to capital T and x0 is given. Okay, so X is the state, U is the control, and the state transitions according to a deterministic state transition function. Okay, there is no noise in the system, so it's not a Markov decision problem. It's a deterministic uh, decision problem. And we have J, which is a function of U1 all the way up to UT, and it's given by GT plus 1, XT plus 1 plus summation equals 0 to capital T GT of XT comma UT. Okay, so these are the cost functions. And the goal is Until now, our goal was to, in the static optimization, find a unique point, well, not a unique, but find a point X star that uh, satisfies first order necessary condition. But now, we have a sequence of decisions to make, okay, and this is the overall objective function, uh, and it's a function of the control actions. So, the goal is find U naught star, oh, this should go from U naught. U T star. So two ways to view this problem. One is to suppress the dynamic nature of the problem and view this problem as a static optimization problem where you are directly minimizing the J uh, of, uh, the, where you are directly minimizing the, the function J uh, by choosing an appropriate value of u naught to u t. Okay, so we suppress, so approach one, suppress 
suppress the dynamic nature okay which is the same as saying view it as a static optimization problem which is the same as saying find optimal open loop control okay you can view these three statements as synonymous in the context of this uh, dynamic optimization problem okay all of you remember this approach right and uh, we used maximum principle in order to uh, find an optimal solution well i shouldn't really say a, uh, an optimal solution i should strictly say that a uh, set of control actions that satisfy first order necessary conditions for optimality so so how do we find so what exactly do we want we want uh we want to find gradient of ut of j okay and if you try to find it you get some very ugly looking expression which is not good i i i don't want to work with ugly expressions so we define something called hamiltonian and it turned out that the gradient of uh, ut of j is the same as gradient of ut of the hamiltonian where ht <coughs> ht is a function of xt ut and pt plus 1 which is uh the sum of gt plus pt plus 1 transpose ft okay and this pt plus 1 actually encodes information about the gradient gradients of the future cost propagated backward okay so how do we define pt plus 1 oh sorry pt so pt is gradient of xt of ht with the uh, p capital t plus 1 given by gradient of xt plus 1 gt plus 1 okay so the other thing that i had mentioned briefly um in the class was Uh, you can view pt as a lagrange multiplier corresponding to some uh, dynamical constraint okay so you can view pt as lagrange multiplier or you can view pt as uh, as a way to propagate the gradients of future cost back into time okay because uh, u of t affects x of t plus 1 x of t plus 2 x of t plus 3 all the way up to x of capital t plus 1 okay so you have to somehow propagate this entire sequence of gradients uh when you are trying trying to find the gradient of j with respect to ut you have to have a way to propagate the gradient of each of these terms that depends on ut you want to propagate it backward and so pt plus 1 or pt in general encodes all that information so multiple ways by which you can view this optimization problem there is no single or unique or correct way of viewing uh or solving this optimization problem the other so if you think of pt as a lagrange multiplier you are essentially lifting the space of 
uh, optimization into a higher dimensional space and then you are trying to solve that problem in the higher dimensional space. So that's another way to look at it. Um, and, and it's your choice, however way you want to look at it, look at this problem, okay? It's fairly, uh, all of them are equivalent in some sense. Okay, so once we, once we recognize this object that we can compute the gradient of J with respect to UT, recursively by following these expressions, then our life becomes easier. Uh, we can come up with an algorithm to compute the optimal open loop control uh, easily. How? Well, you initialize U T zero, U one zero, U capital T zero, okay? And then you do forward propagation find or rather compute x1 to x capital T plus 1 and then you do backward propagation. I should write it as k. This is k equal to 0. So using the forward propagation you compute the states along this chosen uh, control actions and then you do backward propagation to compute pt plus 1 all the way up to p p1 okay So in order to do the forward propagation, all you need is this map, state transition function. And in order to do backward propagation, you start with pt plus 1, for which all you need to know is what is the value of xt plus 1k. I should in index it with respect to k. Okay, and then in order to find pt, p capital T, you need to know what p capital T plus 1 is. So you substitute it back in here and then you compute P capital T and so on, okay? You proceed backward. So that's called backward propagation. And then you update UTK plus one as UTK minus alpha K gradient of UT HT evaluated at step K. Okay, and then you go back to forward propagation, backward propagation and keep doing it, iteratively it will converge to a point that satisfies first order necessary conditions for optimality. So if your algorithm doesn't converge, what do you do? Let's say you are running this simulation and it doesn't converge, what do you do? Change the value of alpha k, right? Make it smaller. And uh, what would that do? That will change the eigenvalues of some contraction maps, right? So, okay. Any questions so far on this on this issue? Question? No? Okay. So once this algorithm converges, I get the optimal open loop control. Open loop controls are bad. All of us know that. So if you are using this algorithm in application, in an actual application, where there may be uncertainties around the state transition function, what do you have to do? You have to run this algorithm at every point of time. Okay, every 100 millisecond, you run this algorithm, figure out how you should, you should control. Then the state changes, okay, you probably get x2, x3 or something. So after 100 milliseconds, you treat the current state as the initial state and run this algorithm again, and so on and so forth. And uh, that would hopefully give you a good performance. Okay, you still need to decide what your terminal time is going to be. So typically if your application is 
computation intensive, you will keep capital T to be five or 10 seconds, okay? If your application is not that computational intensive, you can keep T to be 20 seconds, one minute, two minutes, or whatever, okay? So, uh, so capital T becomes a design parameter in that particular situation. And computational complexity is an important consideration when you actually implement it in practice. Okay, so that's good. This uh, gives us a way to compute uh, optimal control, or I, again, I shouldn't say optimal control. It gives you a way to compute a set of control actions that satisfy first order necessary conditions for optimality. So how do we actually compute an optimal control so Bellman gave this answer back in 1950s and said, you know what? If you want to compute the optimal control in the feedback, uh, an optimal feedback controller, you have to treat this uh, optimization problem as a dynamic optimization problem. Okay, so, so then the goal changed. The goal is to find gamma naught star all the way up to gamma t star, where gamma t star maps x t to u t. Okay, so this is a feedback control law, feedback. So everyone became happy, okay? We can now compute feedback control law. We don't have to go for open loop control law. So how do we do that? What was Bellman's principle of for uh, prin Bellman's principle of optimality? Anyone remembers? Backward, Backward induction. Okay, so find feedback control. No. So you compute VT plus one, so use backward induction, use dynamic programming. Okay, dynamic programming, backward induction, these are all. Uh, same ideas, especially in the context of uh, dynamic decision problem. Okay, so you compute Vt plus one, which is the value function at the terminal time step that just Gt plus one of Xt plus one. Okay, so that's the value at the terminal time step. And then you define Vt of Xt iteratively as min of ut gt of xt comma ut plus vt plus 1 of ft xt comma ut so that gives you the value function and then you define gamma star t of xt as argmin of this ut of the same expression. Okay, and then everyone was very happy. Okay, now we can really compute optimal feedback control laws for a dynamic decision problem. We are not treating it as a static problem anymore, okay? We are treating it as a dynamic problem. We are respecting the fact that this is a dynamic decision problem. And so at every point of time, we need to look at the state and then make a decision. Uh, the, the gamma star or the feedback control law that you get uh, have many good properties, including robustness properties. So if there were unmodeled uncertainties in the system, uh, you wouldn't actually, you would always be on the optimal trajectory, okay? You will never go out of the optimal trajectory. So it has, it satisfies some very good robustness properties 
and you can actually quantify them. So uh, people in robust control actually quantify how good the robustness characteristic of this optimal controller is. Okay, I don't know the details of robust control, so I can't really comment on uh, what are the properties, but I know that people have studied this problem in the past. But there is a huge issue with this problem. And the issue is, I need to keep track of value function, and I need to keep track of the optimal control law. Okay, so for the linear quadratic problem, it was easy. Why was it easy? The value function is equivalent to storing a positive definite matrix. The optimal controller is equivalent to storing a matrix, right? a gain matrix. So that was a very good property of a linear quadratic control problem. Uh, many tracking problems can be cast as a quadratic control problem, but the dynamics may or may not be linear. So you kind of linearize it along the along the trajectory. So for instance, when, when an aircraft is turning right or left, and you want to solve that as an optimization, you want to track a specific profile while it is turning right or left, you actually try to linearize the entire, you try to linearize the dynamics along that entire trajectory, which is a highly nonlinear uh, map. You try to linearize it, and then you apply the tracking control on that linearized uh, model, and Probably it works very well, although I'm not an aircraft expert, but I know I've seen many papers written on this particular topic, okay? Linearizing it, um, using the quadratic cost here for tracking, and then trying to solve that problem, and it has some good properties again, um, and it gives you a very good result. So that's the kind of approximation you can do to implement this result if you do not have adequate computational power. But nowadays, computation is not an issue. Uh, you have very powerful GPUs and machines that can do lots of computation in small amount of time, in which case you can have basis functions that represents value functions. Okay, so you can have Vt plus one of x as ax squared plus bx cubed plus cx4 and so on, I don't know. Uh, fx raised to 6. So you can have some form like this, and then you try to fit an optimal value of a, b, c, d, e, f, all those are constants, and then you proceed backward. That also seems to be giving good results in many reinforcement learning type of problems. So something that you can think about or something that you can use in your research um, in the future. Any question about dynamic decision, uh, the dynamic programming part? No? Okay. Here is my question to you. See, there is a minimization here, okay, that you have to perform. Let's say I use gradient descent to perform this minimization, okay, so as to get the value function. And then I proceed backward. Okay, let's say I have unlimited computational power, I have unlimited storage power, so I can do that, and I can store the value function. Is that going to be the optimal, and let's say I come up with this optimal control law at every point of time, is that going to be globally optimal control law? If yes, why, prove it, if no, why? and give me a counter example or whatever. Give me a rationale for saying no or yes. Okay, let me repeat the question. I know that I have to compute this minimization problem in this dynamic programming step, and I use uh, gradient descent to find the, whatever, minimum value of this particular function. Okay, and the question is, if I proceed backward, and find gamma star t, I, I, wherever it converges, I just use that gamma star t, I assign gamma star t of xt as that u star t, okay, and I proceed backward. Can I claim that the control law that I have obtained is globally optimal? Why? Yeah, you. I know. Why?
Right. So when I write main, it means it's, it has to be a global minimum, right? That's right. Okay, so the gradient descent, if I apply gradient descent, it cannot guarantee that I'll be at the global minimum. Okay, so even though it might sound like I'm converging or getting a globally optimal solution, since I am using gradient descent without proving convexity of this objective function, I cannot guarantee that my value function is the true value function because I may have just converged to a saddle point or point of inflection. Uh, which is, which satisfies the first order necessary conditions, but it's not actually um, optimal point. Okay. So even uh, even if you want to use uh, the feedback control law, there are a lot of pitfalls that you might fall into um, if you're using gradient descent. Okay. I mean, see, it's it's not that it's a pitfall. Okay. This is the best any human can do. These are the only set of techniques that we know. So, but you should be careful about what you write. Okay, you shouldn't write it as this is optimal because we use dynamic programming. Well, you have introduced gradient descent, which is not provably optimal. So, you're not using, you're not getting a provably optimal solution. What is true is that whatever solution you get might work very well in practice. Okay, and that's good enough. I mean, you don't have to go ahead and prove it, unless you are my PhD student, in which case you have to prove it. Okay. Okay, so the drawback of this is high memory requirement and high processing requirement. Then we moved on to uh, multi-state stochastic programming and we talked about huge vendor problem which which is a crucial problem because people become billionaires if they do that problem. Okay? And guess what? The holiday season is coming up. And Amazon is solving these multi-state stochastic programming to uh, fill their warehouses with the stuff that people would be ordering in the next few days. Okay, they don't know what you will be ordering. Okay, you probably know what you are going to order in Christmas or whatever New Year, but they don't know. Okay, and they are solving that multi-state stochastic programming for to make sure that you get the stuff that you want within a specific delivery window. Okay. So the simplest problem in multi-state stochastic programming is a two-state stochastic program. By the way, don't don't think that I'm publicizing or marketing Amazon here. <laughs> Even Macy's is solving the same problem. Walmart is solving the same problem. Uh, I don't know. Uh, JC Penney is also solving the same problem. So uh, I'm not uh, I'm not an employee of Amazon or some sort of secret agent of Amazon here. Okay. So what's the two-stage stochastic program? I have C1 transpose x1 plus expected value of C2 transpose x2 of omega. So Omega is set of uncertainty uh, and is known after x1 is decided, well, after x1 is chosen. Okay, so omega is known in the second stage. So before you make the, uh, op before you optimize x2, omega becomes known. So x2 automatically becomes a function of omega. It doesn't re remain an independent variable anymore. Uh, moreover, you might have constraints of this type. And then you could have Okay, so and you are minimizing over x1 and x2 of omega. Ok, 
Okay. So how do we solve this problem? Well, Pellman comes to our rescue. He says, start backwards. Okay. So now, thanks to Bellman, we'll solve the second stage problem first. So what do we, what's the problem in the second stage? Well, we'll collect all the terms that contains omega together. So stage two problem. You know, my, my handwriting, if you have noticed, has become progressively bad. So this is the worst handwriting ever, okay? Um, because it's the last class. Okay, so stage two optimization problem, it's minimize C2 transpose X2 of omega such that A1 X1 plus A2 X2 of omega is equal to B2 of omega. This minimization will be carried out over X2 of omega. And I'm going to store this value as Q of X1 comma omega. Okay, and X2 star of omega, that will be the solution to this optimization problem. That will tell you how you should behave if omega happens. Okay, so X2 star will be a vector and you should behave according to that fashion. Okay, so that would be your strategy. So X2 star that maps omega to, I don't know, R N2. Okay, this will be your optimal policy. Okay. And then we just add the expected future cost in the first stage optimization problem. So I will try to solve minimum of X1, C1 transpose X1 plus expected value of Q, X1 comma omega. And this expectation is with respect to omega, such that C1, C1, X1 equals to B1. Oh, I've used C1 twice. Okay, D1. I have not used D, right? Okay. D1, X1 equals B1. Okay, and this can give you X1 star. This will give you X1 star, which is the optimal behavior when you don't know what the value of omega is. So that's at the first stage. Okay, so Bellman came to our rescue even for this uh, multi-stage stochastic programming problem. Um, so this is what we studied until Thanksgiving and we uh, talked in detail about news vendor problem which is uh, one of the landmark problem in the theory of stochastic programming because it's simple and it gives you a closed form expression for what the optimal solution should be and how many newspapers should you buy in the morning uh, so as to maximize your long-term profit. Now, after that we talked about Markov decision problems and multi-arm bandit, but I'm not going to cover that again in the class. Uh, that was post Thanksgiving. Uh, so this is what, this is where I'm going to end. So this is what's going to be in the final exam, okay? Nothing more, nothing less. Well. I don't know. Nothing less. Well, nothing less uh, doesn't mean I'm going to ask you too many questions. It's going to be some simple questions based on simple 
concepts and you should be able to answer them by now and you should be able to carefully argue what your position is and why you think that's the right position on the problem. So if something is optimal, say why it is optimal. If something is not optimal, tell me how you can go ahead and prove that it is it will be optimal if I give you additional information about the problem. So um, you are allowed to have two sheets of cheat sheet. So two sheets for the final exam. So the way I would uh, I would organize it, uh, one sheet would be about static problem, second sheet would be about dynamic problem, uh, but then you can organize it any way you want. Uh, what else? Any other question you have about final exam? Front and back. Front and back. Front and so you have essentially four pages of material. Okay, two sheets. Uh, and uh, well, I guess you can bring your calculator, but I don't think you will need your calculator. Okay, so, but please bring your calculator uh, to the exam. Uh, what else? Uh, office hours. When do you want the office hours to be? Twelfth is busy, so Tuesday is busy. I'm available Monday, and I'm, I'm available Wednesday. How many of you would like to? like me to have an office hour on Wednesday morning? Two, three people. Monday morning? Many more people? Okay. So let's say, let's say Monday 10 to 12 noon and Wednesday 10, 30 to 12 noon. Okay. Now Wednesday I have a meeting that ends at 10, 10 a.m. In, the down, in, in downtown Columbus, so uh, I should be here by 10.30, or I could be there before 10.30 as well, depending on the traffic and how much time it takes for, for me to get out of the garage in the downtown. So, uh, but these are the two times when I'll be available in my office, DL464. So you can ask me any question about, uh, about optimization, about what we have covered. Uh, the final exam, it's going to be easier than the homework problem. <laughs> okay, now uh, some more courses that you can take to learn more about optimization. So next semester we have Professor Yingbin Liang teaching ECE 8001, which is Special Topics in Communication. Uh, that's a very brutal optimization class. It talks about some of the theoretical issues in machine learning, including uh, VC dimensions and reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces and whatnot. Okay, some topics that I, I don't understand. Okay, I probably will also be sitting in this class, who knows, okay, to learn about this stuff. Uh, but it, it's, this is a fairly theoretical class, so, uh, so you can take that class to understand more advanced machine learning algorithms. And then ECE 7001, that's a class on stochastic processes and Markov decision problems. So, uh, and also it talks about Martingale theory, which is very useful for proving convergence of optimization algorithms. Uh, so something you might want to think about. Uh, so in this course, we have learned various optimization algorithms, how you can implement them, how they work. Um, we also learned what are the limitations of the optimization algorithms that we, uh, we have developed. We as in the entire community of researchers have developed. The, the major issue is in the absence of convexity, there is nothing much we can do. All we can prove is it converges to some first order, some point that satisfies first order necessary condition. That's the biggest limitation. Um, we talked about how can we improve convergence. Uh, so by changing the value of step size alpha k, you can improve convergence. By adding a momentum term, you can again improve convergence. Um, so when you are thinking about the speed of convergence, you have to think about the contraction coefficient of the map, okay? The learning map that you have developed. And how can you try to move that coefficient closer and closer to zero? That gives you the best learning speed. Uh, we've also learned how to think critically about claims of optimality, okay? When is something optimal, when is it not optimal, okay? It's a very important topic. 
And hopefully this will, having taken this class, will make you more humble when you make claims in your papers and in your, um, in your uh, um, research projects. Okay, and hopefully now you can develop your own algorithms uh, by tweaking some of the existing algorithms that we have talked about in the class and uh, get Nobel Prizes in the future. Who knows? Okay. Uh, so thank you. It was great fun teaching you all. And hopefully you've learned something new in this class. Hopefully you have struggled in this class. And that's a good indicator whether you learned or not. Okay, if you struggled, you learned. If you didn't struggle, you didn't actually learn it. Probably you should go ahead and take 8001. Okay, thank you.